find yourselves in the carriage on your way finally to Kingscombe, finally to meet Mr. D. Aldworth Esquire at the behest of your very own Mr. Christopher Burroughs. You manage to convince and discuss and use your reputational wiles to get yourself out of a rather tricky situation. Reverend, in retrospect, what is it that you did to procure your freedom from that situation? Fortunately, we met uh, some of the Bow Street Runners' finest who actually have their head on their shoulders and recognise that uh, the Lord on the Manor and his uncle are hardly the sort to go around murdering people, particularly when it's their own manservant, of which they became aware very quickly. I think Thomas might have even played cards with their boss, so that helped the situation. But really, it was down to the good nature that the Reverend likes to see in people, the good nature of the child confirming that, no, he didn't actually see people being murdered and when it was explained to the child that they were bringing the poor servant down the child realized this and confirmed this to the policeman even told them about the other man that had been um with chambers the, the, the next day so as we hear from thomas could you reverend give me a reputation roll with your bonus die please that you so very much deserve because of your do. reputational standing thomas so as the good reverend has already explained, the chief constable and Thomas have indeed been known to partake in cards. And the camaraderie that comes from Thomas losing a fair amount of money to the chief constable uh, did help smooth the situation somewhat. Again, the, the large blade that Thomas quickly dropped when the first Bow Street runner entered was quickly kicked underneath a bookcase so as to remove any particularly incriminating evidence. But Thomas, I think, learnt that kneeing a constable in the stomach, or attempting to at least, is not conducive to solving the issue. So as soon as Thomas and the chief constable made that recognition, Thomas went back out of the street to uh, keep a more aloof profile. Uh, while maintaining his haughty looks to ensure that the scene went over smoothly. And Reverend, can, uh, sorry, uh, Reverend, I'm going to ask you your role. Thomas, could you give me a reputational role with the bonus die, please? So the Reverend uh, got a 41 versus 65 success, just a regular success. Okay, so for you, Reverend, um, the Chief Constable who arrived and you finally, as you say, spoke to someone with his head on his shoulders... Oh, right. Yeah, you know, quite right. Quite right. Um, uh, Reverend uh, Prido, huge apologies. Thomas, uh, good to see you again, Thomas. Um, yeah, quite right, Reverend. Yeah, I don't know what... Uh, uh, Nathan's! Yeah, what the bloody hell are you doing? Don't you know who these people are? What? No, uh, get the horses, you bloody fool! It's quite all right. It was rather dark. No, no fault of these gentlemen here. Merely doing their duties in an extreme situation... I don't say that it is uh, very often they come across a murder. Oh well, well you're quite right. But yeah, we 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 try to get the um you know get the get the right people. But uh, Nathan's, I, I will tell you, Reverend, he's a bit of a pork pie short of a picnic, if you know what I mean. Well, well, there is charity in the church if you need it. Yeah, well, <laughs> I can tell you, you don't want his sort in the church either. I mean, yeah, really, really. But anyway, uh, uh, Reverend, thank you very much for clearing up this situation. Not we will all, not at all endeavour to find this uh, other rather d tall, covered individual. Um, rest assured, Reverend Thomas, uh, we shall find the person who um, slayed your manservant. Um, may I ask what do you want done with the body? Is it? Is it? Would you like the? Would you like the, the city to take care of it? We can just get. Rid I of think it. it's only fair that, as much as this man is was a servant, the Prideaux do take care of their own. Um, I'm sure there will be space in a, a grave around the family plot, the family vault. I'm sure we can place him there. After all, he was a good trusty servant to my father I write to the housekeeper I 
she will provide a small allowance for his burial as uh, well. Very good, sir. Very good. Um, Milady, um, I can see you have his experiences, um, left you in a rather, um, improper state. Uh, and I, I, I apologize uh, for anything that's happened here. Um, if there's anything we can do for you, uh, please let, let us know. Oh, please, uh, do not apologize. You just did your job. If, if anything, my brother should be apologizing for his behavior. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> uh, he, ha he holds out his handkerchief to you and just kind of looks over at Thomas and uh, almost in a quieter voice just says <laughs> I've seen worse from your brother at the gambling house <laughs> uh, and uh, just hands you his ha handkerchief because um, you still got a bit of blood coming from your head uh, unfortunately oh, you, you took a bit of a, a bit of a bump um, well um, uh, if there's anything else um, uh, this gentleman uh, he's referring to you Mr Burrows and Mr. Burroughs is just standing there, uh, lip trembling, moustache wilting, eyes wide, blinking back tears, um, and just muttering gently under his breath. Um, so he'll just look up. I, I work for a lawyer. Um, yes. <laughs> it seems to be all in order. Very good. Oh, um, uh, the, the children. Uh, what, yes, what yes, no, don't worry, we've had them, uh, had them taken off, we'll find a workhouse or a, 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 someone, a convent maybe, that can take them in, maybe. Uh, no, Reverend, would you do that? no I, I would like to, um, she looks at uh, Charlotte and her brother, please Charlotte deposit is, the children. Oh. Charlotte's unconscious at the moment, oh, she's sorry, put Charlotte. into the carriage. So, um, <laughs> she's, she has not recovered yet, no, she looks no, at her brother, Charlotte out. isn't there, no. so this is a good time. Um, Please uh, deposit the children at the Prudhoe house. We are indeed lacking a servant, so perhaps uh, they can they can be taken care of there by the staff while we're away. Milady, I'm I'm not sure the, the little urchins are perhaps what, what you're looking for. Um, I can have them taken to one of the house. The we have caused then. them a great a great distress and trauma, and we've caused them their house. Uh, therefore, I believe we owe them uh, a home and uh, some safety so um if if no one else um well i've had a terrible day so perhaps i'm not thinking clearly but if no one else objects um we shall be taking ownership of this of these children chief constable looks over to uh thomas you I heard guess. my sister constable <laughs> we've lost a man <laughs> today i can't deny that i was not a particularly big fan of chambers but that does not make me a murderer uh, but of course not, sir. I feel in the situation, in the circumstances, charity begins at home, what? Yes. Again, when you go to the housekeeper for the money for James's burial, give these two <laughs> urchins to her. <laughs> She'll know what to do. <laughs> I just Very jostled good. the one on my leg. <laughs> you, you see, your, your fortunes are improving. <laughs> Is there, is there? <laughs> and he kind of stands up and uh, kind of like the, the the chief inspector kind of holds the boy's hand with his one hand and um he then uh thomas really without many other people seeing unless they'd like to specifically roll to see if they could see uh thomas the uh, inspector leans towards you and holds out his other hand and looks at the boy and then looks at you and says, well, Mr. Prudhoe, um, they do say, as you say, charity does begin at home. Thomas looks the inspector dead in the eyes. And at home is where you will find the charity. Speak to the housekeeper. Things will be arranged. His hand recoils immediately. You find yourselves in the carriage. It's rambling along the uh, the road. Uh, you've actually uh, left Hampshire uh, now. Possibly you've been on the road for an hour or so. Um, you are slightly behind time, which I think gives everybody a sense of quite sudden reflection. But I think Mr. Burrows is probably the one suffering from this lack of time. And there is a pocket watch of which uh, you uh, regularly check, Mr. Burrows. And 
Charlotte. Yes. You are um, propped against the side of the, the, the carriage quite comfortably. It's not kind of leaning you, not necessarily leaning against the carriage in a sense of let's just put the body there. You are very comfortably, you know, blankets kind of there wrapped very respectfully, but you are kind of sitting into the corner of, of the carriage so that you are propped up. You're not lying down or anything. Everybody still has their ample space within the carriage. But you passed out. You saw a symbol. Not just once, not just twice. You saw it exploded multiple times across the room. And it overcame you. You dropped to the floor. You didn't even feel the the impact of the ground. You were elsewhere by the time your body hit the ground. You find yourself standing on the deck of a ship. Hmm you find the ship listing back and forth. You hear the voices of individuals calling out different uh, ropes, different directions, port, starboard, pull this, pull that, bring this sail down. The voices sound panicked. They sound worried. They sound immediate. They sound threatened. Screams and shouts begin to ripple across the ship. You hear a cannon fire, not from this ship, in the distance. And then in the distance you see, and it is not a calm sea. It is choppy, it is wavy. Your ship that you're on, you feel it listing more, you feel it pulling up and then dropping down. Give me a constitution roll, please. Okay. Extreme success. Six versus 40. You hold your breakfast down quite admirably. You don't see anybody on this ship, but you feel with the voices on this ship, you don't see anybody. There is nobody on this ship. But you feel as you alone stand on this ship at sea that the voices you hear calling left and right and shouting almost over your shoulder. You almost feel the push of someone past you. You think that this ship should be full of a crew. You hear them, you just can't see them. And when this cannon fires in the distance, you see the flash of light. And there's a moment where you count in your head. Could you begin counting down from 10 for me, please? 10, nine, You start eight, counting. You hear seven, voices either side six, of you screaming, one of five. which calls out, Dark. Three, and you hear people two, dropping to the floor. One, and then you hear a voice shout, Prino! And there is an explosion on the ship. You find yourself lifted into the air, off the ship's deck that's wet now and, and half broken. And you're flying through the air. And you see the ship almost roll as you roll in the air, the the explosion pushing you off the ship. And you fall back and you hit the freezing cold ocean water. As you hit that water, you wake up. (gasps) To a, a, a breath, not a scream, to a breath. Everybody in the carriage is doing what they're doing and we'll ask them in a moment what it is that they're doing but you wake up you don't wake up in a way to alert anybody I'm going to allow you to decide what you do and you can narrate that and tell us how that happens but you wake up at that moment so Charlotte wakes up with a massive gasp of air as though she's just been underwater and her lungs have been bursting essentially as though she's been trying to scrabble up for the surface and it's just like this giant (gasps) And she looks around wildly and just starts reaching out with her hands and feeling the wooden walls of the carriage. And for a moment, she's thinking, this this, this is a piece of driftwood. I've got to get on this driftwood. I've, I've, I've got to, or else I'm going to sink. And then she realises, no, she's not on a ship. She's here. She's all right. She's in a carriage. And this was some kind of terrible dream, maybe. She doesn't know what's going on. Anastasia 
Christopher Burroughs, Thomas, the Reverend, you all see this. This isn't something that, that, that Charlotte is doing quietly. She's <gasps> brought herself up and is grabbing onto the walls of the carriage. This draws all of your attention. What do you do? Charlotte, Charlotte, are you OK? The ship. I was on a ship. What? No, where, where are we? We were in the bookshelf and then the bookshop. That symbol. The waves. The mast. That's what it is. It, it's a ship's mast. It's a ship's mast on the water and, and, and there's a boat and... Prito. Anastasia, I, I'm so sorry, but I, I think your father died at sea. Charlotte, did, did you did you just did you have a nightmare? I, I don't I don't understand. I don't know. I don't I, know what it was. I've had some dreams too. Anastasia, it's... if if you've come over to Charlotte and you've describe, can you describe to me physically where where you are in relation to Charlotte right now? Um, I think I would have gotten close to her and kind of hold held her onto her hand. As I mentioned, this is a large, you know, extravagant carriage. There is space for you to, you know, essentially you are sitting and it's not the, yeah. you know, but it is rather luxurious. You mm. have space, but you go over, you hold her hand. Her hand's wet. You must have been sweating. <laughs> so it's, not, it's, it's, it must have been terrifying for you. You're just, you're wet. Her dress is wet. Wow. The blanket that is covering her is dry. Are you okay, Charlotte? And Charlotte's going to just kind of take the hem of her dress and just kind of lift it up and give it a very sort of delicate sniff to see, does it smell of the sea? Is this sea water that she can smell? Without a roll, the smell of the briny seawater and the salty uh, essence is very present. Oh. Is that a sanity roll? (laughs) Not yet. Okay. So you've been sweating very salty (laughs) briny sweat. (laughs) She's secretly a mermaid. This This is the thing. And I think she will look at the reverend and just think and just say, reverend what what happened? Is there a, a a demon or something? What caused this? Oh, good goodness, goodness, Miss Lambert, uh, you've simply had a bad dream. We have had quite the stressful day, but uh, we we must be mindful of the imagery. This is seawater. This is seawater. This this is not a dream. Did I did I dream getting my my dress so wet? And she pulls the blanket off of herself and just sees that her her gown is. Very damp. Uh, the Reverend does not want to think where that water has come from. Um, <laughs> I can tell you, Reverend, that this is shoulders, arms. It's not necessarily centralised on someone perhaps having an extreme fear and relieving themselves accidentally. This is the entire dress is is wet. Her hands are wet. They're not a part of her dress. Her, her, you now actually notice that you may think she's been sweating, but her face is damp. Her face is wet. There are beads of water. Her hair is wet. I, I, I must not have been paying, paying, paying attention. Did, did, we, did we drive through a puddle or, 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 or of some sort? I mean, I, I do not wish to diminish your uh, experience and, and your, your dream. Uh, you know, we must be mindful, as I was saying, uh, about the imagery. D- d- describe what you say. You say there was a, a, a mast and some, some water in, in, the, in this symbol? Uncle, the blanket is dry. The symbol. In the bookshop, everything that everything every square inch that there was of wood anywhere was carved with this symbol and it was the the circle and the mast and the waves and it was like a stab it was like a stab in my head and then then i fell to the floor and then when i woke up i was on a ship there weren't enough crew that there should have been more but i i heard them there was a battle right right and then i saw the light there on the horizon, the light of a cannon being fired. And then 
I was flung off the deck, but I heard somebody. I heard somebody shouting, Prido. And then I hit the water. And that's when I woke up, right here. I was drowning. George, I was drowning. Don't you understand? Death by water. That, that That's what just happened to me. But I think I was him. I think I was Prido. It sounds like you might have been the uh, Master Thomas. Didn't we read about a Prido that was lost at sea? Perhaps. We did indeed. Uh, Lord Matthew. Oh. Oh, yes. Then not... Then not your father. Perhaps this is Perhaps. some physical manifestation uh, from beyond the grave. Anastasia, this blanket. Are you sure it, 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 it is dry? How could this be? Is there a leak in the carriage roof? It must be. There, there is going to be a logical explanation for this. As far as I know, people don't just have dreams and live them. As Thomas references, there may be a leak in the carriage roof and possibly attempts to have a look. Mr. Burrows, the Reverend has just suggested that it was Matthew Prudo who died at sea. Hmm. It's not what you know. Working for Mr. Oldworth, you've been sent to deliver a summons so that the last will and testament and the last wishes of... Lord Matthew Prido can be read out. His body, for all you know, has been laid out at Prido Manor. Well, Mr. Burroughs looks up sharply from the uh, small leather-bound uh, notebook he's been scribbling in with a pencil in between bumps in the road uh, through his old-fashioned little round-framed uh, spectacles behind them. His eyes are wide. Um, and, forgive me, Lord Matthew, uh, died at sea, you say? Um, well, that uh, is one way of looking at it. Why, do do beg to differ, sir? Well, I, I, um... He licks his finger and he starts flicking backwards through the page of his notebook, frowning. Um, I had, I had thought, that is to say, uh, Mr. Aldworth, um, is, is well informed and, and he informed me. I, I thought, I thought, I, I thought Lord Matthew was, was laid out, um, a Prido Manor. A, a death at sea is, 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 is not what, uh, not what we were. Aware of. Mr. Apprentice, you might have more information than we do. As you can imagine, some strange circumstances are surrounding our family at the moment. I confess, I am not entirely sure what we will find at Prado Manor. It's part of the reason we are attending this arrangement by your employer to see what the fuss is all about. Uh, you'll forgive us if we don't discuss family business with you quite as openly, and we would appreciate your discretion, if you wouldn't mind, as we talk amongst ourselves uh, with our fanciful <laughs> thinking, Mr. Apprentice. Is that uh, suitable? Oh, my, my dear sir. Um, <laughs> and he inflates his little uh, toast rack of a chest. Um, we are... Your family's solicitors, you may, uh, indeed you must, discuss your family's business with, with myself and with Mr. Aldworth, of course, but you may, of course, uh, rely upon our discretion. And he poises his pencil over his notebook again. Just as this is happening and there is a uh, discussion of family business on the horizon, um, Charlotte, this is where the, the sand roll that um, Anastasia mentioned comes in. This is the moment where you are beginning to process the dream, the reality of being soaked through with salt water, but more importantly, on top of those things, everybody except Anastasia, I say everybody, Thomas and Reverend George have essentially denied this reality. They have questioned your legitimate concerns. This is where your sanity role comes in. She's probably worried that she's going to be sent to Bedlam if she keeps talking like this. And, oh no, that was a really bad fail. That was 98 versus 55. Okay, 98 versus 55. Fumbly McFumble. Okay, um, <laughs> I think what's going to happen here is you're going to have to roll me a d6, please, Charlotte. 
Ooh. Okay. And unfortunately, it's a D6 plus one. Oh. Oh, well, luckily, I only rolled a one. So that is two sanity points that you lose. And rather okay. than any uh, ongoing you know, extreme, it was quite a limited loss of sanity there for such a, a devastating moment. I am going to leave you with a lingering thought, though, Charlotte. Thomas and the Reverend completely dismissed what had happened to you. There was an interest. They queried it. But they didn't believe you. You, Charlotte, is it because you're not a real Prido? Ooh. And the carriage rolls on and you hear, as that thought seeps into your head, Charlotte, you hear the good reverend say, let us talk family business. The carriage rolls on and I'm sure there is family business to discuss. The, the day passes. You do actually find uh, that, that there is, um, from Mr. Burroughs, uh, quite a respectable uh, property that you spend the evening in, and there is wonderful food outlaid. You are kept to yourselves. And if it's okay, we'll have a very quick conversation there in terms of any family business you wish to discuss, or if there's anything overnight you'd like to do, because you'll be back on the carriage the next day, and you'll be making at absolute uh, haste your way to Kingscombe to make sure you are on time um, at Mr. Burroughs's quite obvious um, concern to make sure that Mr. D. Oldworth Esquire's wishes are kept in order. So uh, very quickly, over dinner, is there anything that's discussed? And then I'll ask you after that, is there anything that you do personally, either in the night or during the carriage ride to Kingscombe? So dinner, family business. So, uh, Mr. Burrows, I, uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, bringing us down on, on this journey. As, as we talk uh, family business, it, it would be remiss of me to uh, see, young man, where do you see yourself in, in five years or so? Where is your life headed? You know, it's, it's, it's a big, big world out there full of uh, mystery and, well, sometimes death and uh, none of us are getting uh, younger, that is for sure. Where, where do you see yourself? Uh, mar married, perhaps? Uh, you know, serving in the Navy? Uh, perhaps perhaps uh, in, in the clergy? Uh, perhaps. Why, sir, I, I have already found my vocation. I am, as you know, apprentice to the great Mr. Aldworth, and I, I very much hope, um, five years, I, goodness, I don't know, but I, I do very much hope as soon as possible to open my own firm, um, perhaps in, uh, well, perhaps in Plymouth, or, or perhaps in, uh, I, I, I hail from Holmouth. Perhaps I shall return there. I do miss it sometimes. Right. Well, well, I mean that 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 is good news. I have heard of these. Uh, what are what are they called, Thomas? Industrialists, the, the, the people who who don't have any land but uh, are do very well at their, their their business. Is is that is that what they are called? Uh, you can call them industrialists, Uncle. You can call them commoners. That's really what they are. But uh, I think they prefer the term industrialist. It gives them a certain je ne sais quoi, as it were. Oh, well, indeed, indeed. Uh, uh, but but, young Thomas, that that is a sort of uh, talk that got the French exactly uh, into the revolution, you know. They didn't listen to the people. They didn't hear them singing you know, the songs of angry men and all that. But uh, no, 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 we, we must pay attention to this. Uh... Just as you talk about the, the French and the songs and the, the this, one of the, uh, one of the, uh, 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 the, 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 the property you're staying at, one of the serving um, ladies comes out. And just as you're saying, you know, look at what happened to the French. She just leans over and just goes, would you like to eat cake? <laughs> <laughs> the French aren't all that bad, uh, Uncle. After all, dear Charlotte did marry one. Absolutely. At least he had the good sense to die. <laughs> no, 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 Thomas, Thomas, Thomas. Uh, the, the French are delightful people, make jolly good wine, and um, for a moment the Reverend catches himself thinking of the family he knew when he was around 20 and the sad news that they'd all gone to the guillotine and uh, has a moment of realisation uh, that death is around the corner. And, and then he brings himself uh, back to uh, Mr Burroughs and wonders uh, when, when these industrial types 
usual. I, I, I've heard uh, a good connection is marrying into a well-established family, you see. It, it, it's, it's to do with investment, I understand, you know. A, a connection with a well-established family, uh, such as the Prados, would would be able to invest in a company, give you a little bit of a lag up, you know, to, to have your own business sooner rather than later. You turn a pretty penny with uh, all the illustrious clients and everything, everything like that. Has uh, anything like that uh, ever crossed your mind? His eyes uh, widen and gleam. Uh, why, sir, I... I confess I'd not aspired so high. Um, I d marriage uh, is, um, well, I hadn't really, I, I've, been, I've been focused on my career, you see. Ah, ah, nonsense, nonsense. All work and no play makes somebody very dull indeed. But uh, what we shall have to do, um, has your employer uh, arranged a, a celebration of the life of uh, Mr. Prudhoe? Well, uh that's a good question. Are we in charge of arranging the funeral keeper? Um, you're not. At the moment, you are in charge of arranging, essentially, uh, from what you've been told, is bringing the remaining Prudos back to Prudot Manor to be present for the reading of a last will and testament, uh, which is being handled by your employer. You are aware that this particular death um, it's had an impact within the community. Even in the small time that you were in Kingscombe, you could see uh, that there was an impact in the community and that some preparations were being made. But to, to what extent, you know not. Okay. Um, well, I relay that um, I, we we begin, you see, with the reading of the will. Um, we, uh, Mr. Aldworth, that is to say, is charged with the management um, of the late Lord Prideau's estate and uh, and thus with communicating uh, his wishes and the contents of the will um, to his surviving relatives. Um, we we begin there, and then and then a, a funeral arrangements uh, will will follow, no doubt. Indeed, in, indeed, in, in, indeed, and, uh, and like I say, a, a celebration of of, of uh, his life, perhaps, perhaps a dance, a, a ball of sorts, if if you wouldn't mind, uh, Anastasia, you you enjoy balls, don't you? Um, yes. That's the spirit. Yes, Uncle. And 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 uh, Miss Lambert, perhaps we could add a, a little French flavour. To, to, to the ball when, when, when we have one. I think it is a... In, in times there must be a, a time to sorrow, a time to reap and a time to sow. I, f I forget how things... Uh, the song a goes, time but to mourn at a time to dance, perchance? That's the one. Yes, you, you see, I, you really should uh, come to church more and more often. We could do with somebody with your lovely, lovely spirit. But uh, yes, yes, yes. Celebrations, celebrations, and he goes back to his food. Charlotte, when the Reverend speaks to you like that and says you could bring some, you know, French, uh, so je ne sais quoi to the evening, he's referencing your history. He's mm. talking about your ex. He's bringing that up in front of Mr. Christopher Burroughs. And then yes. he talks about, well, you should come to the church. What is that, a slur? Is that a slander? Is there a reason you need to be at the church? Charlotte, you can't but help hear that voice in your head. You're not a real Prido. She's feeling very fragile right now. So the whole day's events are starting to replay in Charlotte's head, not just the you're not a real Prido voice from everything that's been said, but also... The Reverend wanted her to leave during the bookshop. He wanted her out of the way to kind of take the urchin out and tell him a story. And it's like, does he think I'm some kind of servant as well? Is that is that what I'm supposed to be? Some nursemaid? Yes, she's working as a lady's companion. She never intended to have to work for a living. She thought she was going to spend a wonderful life just dancing across Europe with her French poet. And then he went and died of cholera and um, everything changed. And, and she's had to try and rehabilitate herself with the family. But she wonders, is she ever going to really be one of them? And oh, now no. with this thing with the, uh, the ship, does she, do people think she's mad as well? 
It's not as if the actual Prudos have bizarre premonitions and dreams. On that note, Mm -hmm. the evening passes, conversation is had, pleasantries are made, and everybody maintains a reasonable sense of reputation and status within the evening, even though there are some blurred lines between this group that seems to be growing ever closer and just slightly more abstracted. The Reverend goes off to bed. Thomas goes off taking a bottle with him. Mr. Burroughs sits and makes notes. He makes notes. Charlotte eventually, watching the Reverend leave with slightly narrowed eyes, draws herself off to her room. And eventually, Anastasia, you're left on your own, sitting there thinking about everything that's happened. Thomas keeps keeping these situations at an arm's length from you. You find that every time someone of import comes into the situation to defend or aggress or whatever, you find that you are at arm's length. How does that make you feel, Anastasia? My father told me to look after my brother, and yet my brother won't stop posing obstacles and treating me as if I'm some kind of young girl. My uncle, too. It's uh, frankly insulting. I feel like the only person I can really trust is Charlotte, but then again, she did read that letter without letting me know, so maybe even she doesn't respect me. (laughs) Who can you trust? I know they want what's best for me. I just, I just don't think they see me. You know, that thought runs through your head. I just don't think they see me. They just don't see me. And if I may presume, Anastasia, everybody else has gone to bed. You follow suit. You go up to your room, close the door. There's a sense of anger. They don't see you. There is a letter on the floor of your room at this house in the middle of nowhere that you've stopped off at on the way to Kingscombe. Hmm. Well, please, Anastasia, tell me what it is that you would like to do. I'd like to um, make sure my door is closed, sit on my bed and look at the letter. I will tell you there is a key on your door as well, so you are, if you wanted to, in a position to be able to lock said door. Mm, who can access my front door? There is just oh. a front door with a key that is left on the inside of the lock, and it's the same for all of the rooms. Are there servants and staff that might need to access the room? They possibly have been in during the day. This is a uh, quite a beautiful house in the country. It's not a pub it's not a hotel or anything it's quite a reasonable house but it is a house that they are in the recognition that they are not quite of your family status and they do open their doors to traveling um should we say gentry uh to increase their own reputation and host such wonderful guests but unfortunately they are also away at the moment so it's just the serving staff of the house okay i think uh anastasia finds it really hard to get up from the bed and open the door if someone knocks so she'll leave it unlocked so they can let themselves in if needed she doesn't feel that insecure about anyone entering her room um laziness trumps why would she (laughs) fear (laughs) um (laughs) i love that that should be the name of the scenario laziness trumps fear um so Anastasia, as you walk into your room, as you're preparing to uh, engage in your evening's laziness, you do see an envelope is on the floor of your room. There is a a candle lit beside the bed on a small table. Okay. Uh, Taking the candle, trying to suppress any memories of the other candles he's seen recently, and uh, looking at who the letter is addressed to, maybe if uh, the handwriting is familiar before she opens it. You are very tired. It's been a bloody long day and quite a lot's happened and you're feeling the weight of the day and the tiredness upon you. But you can't not recognise that handwriting. You're very aware of who it's from. How in the world did he find me? (laughs) Okay, well, let's see it. Okay, you uh, open the letter. 
All right. To my intended Anastasia, your attempts to engage me in the search of your missing father are rather hollow and I dare say childish. You wish to use my affection to evade the scandal circling your father's disappearance and even employ my services in the discovery of your father's location. Even though I am painfully aware of your empty promises and false desire to bring peace between us to quiet me, I accept your offer, yet see it more as a challenge. What, pray tell, do you think will happen to the good Prudhoe family name when I discover your father's secrets and reveal them for all to see? What would you be willing to give to have me keep these secrets? What would your family be willing to give to protect the family legacy? I will find your father, I will uncover his secrets, and I will give you the chance to accept me offer. He says, accept me offer, so the accent changes there a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> be well, my intended, and get some sleep. You look tired. My unwavering love, Mr. Steven Jenkins. That is... I terrifying <laughs> and you do look tired oh he's creepy i mean i hazard that i always look tired my appearance is 35 so it doesn't freak me out too much <laughs> she just throws the letter on the floor i always look tired anyone could have said that charlotte's always chasing off the cucumber slices to put in your eyes <laughs> <laughs> Anastasia, I'm going to ask if there's anything that you do this evening after receiving such a letter. Is there anything you do with it? Is there anything you uh, perhaps think, ponder, act upon, plan to act upon uh, before the morning brings us to the carriage ride and we arrive in Kingscombe? Uh, Anastasia's first impulse is to go and tell someone. However, after all her recent thoughts about the way people have been treating her, she decides not to because she feels that um, they will judge her and deem her um, childish for trying to do this and failing. This time, fear trumps laziness and she will lock her door just in case he has actually seen her. It is very curious how he has managed to find her in this location that she hasn't told anyone else she's in. And it is uh, quite scary, so she'll probably be a bit paranoid for a while. Um, uh, make make sure the windows are good and okay. locked as well. Uh, I think that's fair to say that you're <laughs> able to do. You're able to you know lock any doors or windows that you'd like. You're able to kind of secure this room. There is only one one door in and out. Uh, there is a small uh, area, beautified area that you can use as well. But it's it's, it's a secured area. You're quite confident that. If someone wants to come in here, they've either got to climb up the side of the building and come in the window, or break down the door to your bedroom, which surely those things won't happen. Mm. And with that, everyone sleeps. Everybody sleeps. I'm going to ask for... You just bear with me here, everybody. I, I'm going to start with a power off from Anastasia, please. Success. 45 over 65. Success. Okay, so I'm then going to ask you, Anastasia, to roll a um, d4 and okay. half it for me, please. So that's a one. Okay. Anastasia, you drop off to sleep. And it's so incredibly bizarre that you're asleep, but for the first time, oh, it's a wave of relief for the first time in 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 a week because these dreams have been growing in intensity and frequency and right now oh my you are not standing on a sandy beach you do not have the sand between your toes and it is a wonderful feeling can you give me a constitution roll please why not that is an extreme success with a three over 45 Okay, with that extreme success and the knowledge that you are not standing on a sandy beach, which is an absolute revelation and a relief, you feel the listing of a boat oh. leaning from one side to the next. This isn't your dream. This is something you've never known, you've never experienced. You feel the bob and weave of the boat moving. There's nobody else there. There's no one there. There's no voices there. The boat just bobs 
you are on the main deck. You can see the long extended ship before you. You can see uh, sails blowing in the wind. You can see masts. You can see wheelhouses. You can see uh, the doors that lead further into the ship. You can see off into the horizon. Can I ask what it is that you'd like to do? There's no one around me, and I'm just on a boat. Just you, on your own. The ship seems to be sailing fine. Okay. I don't think she would do anything yet. Unless something happens, she'll hope that it's a dream and it passes. Although she is worried about the boat dream that Charlotte has had. So you're standing on the boat, taking it in. Is that what's happening? I think so. I'm going to ask you for a spot hidden, please. That is a failure. 83 over 45. It's just having a nice boat ride. <laughs> You're standing there, and there is, I hate to say, a significant amount that you don't see in <laughs> this unique moment where this unusual large boat, almost a warship of sorts, is bouncing on the waves. There is one thing you can't help but see because it's right there in front of your face. As you turn, you see that there is the mast, there are a number of ropes, there are a number of rope bridges, and then you see in the doors that lead into the ship, carved above the door is a name. Mm. And the name above the main door is the Devonshire. And as you hear that, Oh, or rather, as you see that name, the door to the ship slams open, and from inside, you hear a sound. <laughs> what do you do? Hello? Is someone there? I think she's going to take a few steps back and consciously out of fear. As you step back, you can just make out in the darkness in those doors. And you don't need to roll for this, because you've seen this before. There's a red light somewhere just, just flickering within the darkness in there. And then you hear, quite hard to work out where, there's almost a pop. Come back from 10 for me, please. 10. You're not sure where nine, the pop comes from, eight, but the noise from the door seven, six, begins five, to increase. And as four, it does, you take a step back and three, the boat is slippy. Two, and as you take one, one more step back, zero. Boom, the ship rocks. It turns, it sounds like it splits, the wood cracking, the screams of people, the screams of whatever is in that ship echo through the, the, the entire landscape or seascape and through your mind and you are thrown up into the air and you fall into the ocean and you wake up in your bed with a scream, a gasp, a, a, a physical jolt Tell me, Anastasia, how do you wake up? Probably a scream. This has happened too many times before. It's just escalating. Anastasia has had a terrible evening, and now she's absolutely terrified, uh, uh, jumping any, up. Anybody who feels their room is relatively close enough, you're welcome to make a uh, listen roll with a uh, uh, penalty die because of the, the distance of the rooms in the house. This is not the same layout as the Prudo household. She also um, checks you... to see if she's wet because this uh, sounds familiar. You are. The bed is bone dry, but your nightgown is sopping wet. And you inadvertently can just almost smell and taste the salt on it. I think Anastasia will scream again, but this time in anger, like a, like a good shriek. Like, ah! So let's have a little look if anybody was able to listen because it might change some of the narratives. So, uh, Reverend. Reverend was a failure. 60 versus 20. And um, Thomas, did you roll? Uh, again, another failure. That's a 45 over 20. Oh, dear. 
And uh, Mr. Burrows? That's actually a success. I think that's a 43 under 55. So you are able to react if you'd like to. I do. So uh, I guess Miss Prado hears a, a tentative tap tap at her door. Well, the door is locked. <laughs> so. Who is it? Um, Miss Prado, it, it, it's me. Mr. Burrows, you, you're quite all right. No! Oh dear. I, it's quite loud. Can I, uh, can I be of some assistance? What's the matter? I'm wet. Oh dear. <laughs> um, should I call, uh, perhaps a female servant or? She gets up and unlocks the door and she just goes like, she just, you know, stands in front of him and points to her dressing gown. It uh, happened to me too. I was almost going to ask Mr. Burrow for a constitution roll there, <laughs> seeing this this uh, uh, w- lady uh, standing before him in a nightdress and wearing oh, a completely sappy, sappy yay. Um, A wet nightdress. Mr. Burrows, how do you react to this? <laughs> um, abject shock. <laughs> he staggers backwards. Um, he drops his spectacles uh, and starts fumbling around <laughs> on the ground for them. Um, oh, Mr. Burrow. Oh, goodness me. Um, is, there, is there been some sort of accident? What? Oh, dear. I had the dream. Don't you see? It happened to me too. Same as Charlotte. And it was terrible. And the ship and the red light, as always, as before. And and then there's, there's Jenkins. I, I can't. I can't deal with all of this at the same time. First, Chambers and Jenkins and the dreams and everyone... It's just everyone ignoring me all the time. Oh dear. You must know what that feels like. Oh dear. Uh, well, <laughs> Mr. Aldworth is not, perhaps not forward, but, 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 Miss Bredow, um, uh, you're clearly distressed. Please, please, um, uh, sit down, uh, or perhaps, um, change into something, um, uh, something dry, and, and I, sh- I shall no, fetch your... No, this is proof. I have to stay in this. Otherwise, they won't believe me. Deja, with your insistence to stay in this um, salt water soaked <laughs> uh, nightdress, uh, we are going to ask you for a reputation roll because uh, Mr. Burroughs is not a part of your family. He is uh, employed <laughs> elsewhere and um, he is doing his absolute best to uh, 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 behave in this situation. Uh, the conversation with her uncle is is speeding back through Mr. Burroughs' brain, <laughs> sped up, and he's just hearing the line, have you considered marrying into a family, perhaps the Prideaux's, just over and over, shriller and shriller. <laughs> and the blush is just rising from the collar of whatever bizarre night garment he's wearing. Uh, she failed her reputation role, unsurprisingly, with a 70 over 53. So... Mr. Burrows, I'm going to ask you something here. Um, and I'd like you to uh, not consider the lovely player. I'd like you to consider the character in the situation in regards to <laughs> it is just yourself and it is um, Lady Anastasia Prido. You are alone, but she is acting in a way that is not befit for her station in society. But it is only you there. So... There is going to be a reputational loss for Anastasia, without doubt. But the severity of said reputational loss can be negated by your interpretation of events, and I suppose your action in regards to these events. So, what would you? How would you consider this situation, and 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 how would you act from this? Is it something that you're going to alert people to? Is it something that you keep to yourself and to uh, Anastasia? What is it that happens here, Mr. Burroughs? Hmm. Now, very recently, I saw um, her brother and uncle, who are just down the hall, uh, manhandling a corpse. It's probably been one of the most frightening couple of days of uh, Mr. Burroughs' young life. So I think his first instinct will be to try to not make them angry. Uh, He tries to usher her back into her room. He's on the point of following her, and then he realizes he mustn't cross that threshold. It is not good for him to be in her bedroom. So he just 
he maintains a, a flurry of, uh, no, 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 please, 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 you must sit down, you must, please, control yourself. Miss Prideau, um, I shall fetch your, uh, your uncle, perhaps. No, please, uh, look at this, and she gets her letter from Miss Jenkins. I can't show anyone else this, but you're a lawyer. Uh, tell me what you think of this, like, legally, please. Oh, uh, quite, yes. Uh, <clears throat> um, he'll prop up his spectacles up his nose and, uh, and inspect it. Um, your, uh, is intended, Miss Prideau? You have a, a, a betrothed? N not quite. He tried, and then I thought that perhaps if I uh, perhaps uh, gave him the impression that there was a possibility, then maybe he could help me find my father. But you see, it didn't quite work out. And I'd love it if you please could didn't 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 tell my family, as I am I am quite embarrassed. This is a kind uh, confidentiality. Is that a thing? <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> Client attorney confidentiality, perhaps, or whatever you call it. <laughs> Old timey language. Old timey language. I assume that. that sort of arrangement must have been around since the birth of lawyers, otherwise, nobody would trust them. Nobody trusts them now. Quite possibly, quite probably. Uh, Mr. Burroughs, as you um, take this letter and you intend to read it, I imagine uh, in this rather dark room, it's quite difficult to do. I mean, there is a, there is a candle over by the bed that has been lit within a, within a lamp. Um, <laughs> He darts a fearful glance <laughs> up the corridor, <laughs> just sort of leans, have any doors showing signs of opening. There's no sounds, nobody's stirring. <sighs> okay, <laughs> he steals himself. Miss Prideau, you understand, um, I really should not uh, enter your bedroom, particularly, um, he sort of waves a hand at her state of dress or undress. Okay, I just hold on for one minute and I'll put on something else and then, then you can look at it. Is that is that... Uh, yes. Okay. Very well. Uh, I also, he sort of plucks at his, I don't know what they wore back then, nightgowns, I suppose. Mm. I shall, uh, shall fetch a coat. Um, <laughs> be back shortly. Can yes. I keep that while you're gone? No, no, he goes and he's taking the letter. <laughs> <laughs> but just before he leaves the room, in that almost confession there, Mr. Burrows, you pat your nightgown uh, referencing that you are there and you pluck it and perhaps pop your glasses away, you feel, oh, <laughs> something in the pocket. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Almost like a small, a small piece of paper. And the fact that there is a letter that's been delivered here that's clearly just <laughs> sent a sense of concern, there's this small piece of paper in your pocket. Before you leave the room, Mr. Burrows... You pull out this small piece of po uh, paper, <laughs> and as you do, you realise it's a card. Uh, oh, how strange. Uh, he's absentmindedly tucking uh, Jenkins' letter into this pocket as he draws the card out. <laughs> Why don't... Uh, I don't understand. I, my, my, how did this get here? And as... You say, Mamai, how did this get here? You show this card to Anastasia, and it is another tarot card. It is the Seven of Swords, which depicts a young gentleman carrying seven rather sharp blades all by the edge. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for Cult and Culpability. Remember, you can find us at www.miskatonicplayhouse.com and you can also visit the main stage for other scenarios from the Miskatonic Playhouse with links in the show notes below. Please like and subscribe and if you can spare a minute to leave a review, it makes a huge difference to other like-minded listeners who will be able to find and enjoy our work. Until next time, when the curtain rises again.